Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Black Tower podcast. I am Andrew. And I'm Aaron. And it is absolutely fantastic to have you guys back. Uh, I think we got an interesting topic today for you guys, uh, something that's definitely uh, a memorable concept from the series. So without further ado, Aaron, you want to hit us with that super special spoiler warning? Hey guys, this episode contains selected portions of several books in the Wheel of Time. If you've not read the entire series, you are in danger of being spoiled. You have been My hands warned. are clean. <laughs> I wash my hands of this. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, from the last episode, we introduced with a quote, and I really like that idea. That was Aaron's idea. Um, so we're going to do that again. <clears throat> so here's a quote for you. It says, sometimes Gia to makes for a very great jo- makes for very great jokes. I would laugh my sides apart if I were not the butt of this one. I will meet my toe. That is from Avienda of the Nine Valley Seth of the Tarada Ale, uh, IL, sorry. And that can be found in Lord of Chaos chapter 19, which is aptly named Matters of Toe. T O H, not T O E. That'd be weird. Right. Or funny. Just an entire There's so chapter. many jokes that could be made. Can you imagine just an entire <laughs> so chapter about somebody's toe? I have a great toe. <laughs> I have nine others that are not so great. It has been foretold that a man with a great toe in the Corinthian cycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, Aaron, you want to start us off with what Gia to is? Yeah. So if you haven't guessed, we're talking about Gia to, um, which is um, it's this complex system of honor that the AL follow. It determines all of the interactions in their lives, fighting, um, housing, even their intimate relationships and marriage. The term is from the old tongue, and it means literally honor and obligation. G is honor, and to is obligation. And I think the A is like a conjoining syllable, which makes it G a to. Yeah, I think it's like the way Y is used in Spanish, like E. Yeah, that that's how I took it anyways, um, reading some of the other things in the old tongue that are like conjoined together to make a new a new word. Yeah. Um, in Gito, the greatest G or honor comes from touching an armed enemy in battle without harming them. This incurs a great deal of toe or um, obligation on the enemy. And the person who is touched usually becomes Gaishain. Yeah. Gaishain in the old tongue means um, pledged to peace in battle. A Gaishain serves his or her captor for a year and a day, touching no weapon, doing no battle, wearing only white. Wise ones, blacksmiths, women, and, a, and children under the age of 10 and those under the age of of 16 may not be made guy shine yeah, it's a woman with a child okay yeah so a like woman a, who has a yeah, child so basically who, that is under the age of 10 i think it's like meant to be taken well it can i think that'd be anywhere from pregnancy up to like women with children that are 10 or younger right somebody who has a dependent yeah. child and then just anyone that's under it's like 16 or younger you know so it protects like the children before they've had time to become ample warriors. Right. Which is a crazy thought, even in IL society. I don't think I'd want to fight even like a 12 year old, As, you know, especially if they're like a stone dog or a far dress man, you know, the maidens of the spear. Right. Well, uh, the, the AL culture has some strange holdovers from um, the age of legends. Yeah, and when they were, they were a peaceful people. Um, yeah, that that was crazy to learn. I can see why it broke society as it did. Yeah, I think the 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 way of the leaf of the, that the tinkers follow. I think the al actually followed that also, although I don't think it's explicitly stated before, but. Like they have this 
aversion to swords, like they can't touch a sword. And I think that comes from not being allowed to touch weapons. Yeah, I think it And does. they've just kind of loopholed a way around it with a spear and knives and things. Yeah, I mean, they obviously used to be a very, very different culture, even in the current age, um, because they had the Mm -hmm. peace treaty with Karim until you had uh, Laman Laman Sen, uh, you know, where he he cut down the tree that grew from the sapling of uh, Avendorsa. Right. You know, the tree of life. Um, so obviously they were very different people. They were open to being interactive with the world across the dragon wall. You know, what we consider is the most of the world outside of the IL waste, um, or as they call it, the treefold land or threefold land rather. Um, the treefold land. Yeah. The treefold land. All the trees are folding over in half. Nope. No leaves. Um, but yeah. So, um, with Giotto, the least amount of G comes from killing an enemy, uh, as the IL believes that killing is far easier than disarming or capturing an opponent. So there's a lot of like honor and skill in Giotto that obviously they, they recognize it takes a lot more skill to take your opponent's weapons and you know basically touch them without ever having to actually hurt them than it is to just straight up go up and you know stab them in the throat or something. Uh, but they obviously have no quarrels about doing either especially when it comes to uh, the wetlanders, as they call them. Right. Anybody not from um, from their society is thought of as not having any honor at all. Yeah. Um, so under Giotto, shaming acts incur that obligation, again, that toe towards someone or yourself. So it doesn't have to be against someone else. You can have toe to yourself. Um, right. And only the one committing the act can know the degree of shame or obligation incurred. So there's, a, again, that um, massive em- like emphasis on personal integrity, on honor, on doing what you feel uh, adequately makes up for, you know, whatever wrongs you have done in terms of a, a, a accruing toe. Uh, toe can be met by being a guy, Shane. Enduring physical punishment, performing shameful or trivial labor, depending on how it was incurred. The more toe incurred, the more harsh or shameful the punishment must be to meet it. So some examples um, of shaming acts of things that can incur toe. <clears throat> um, reminding or asking a guy Shane of their life before putting on white. Being guy Shane is kind of a, a, par- a parenthesis in IL life. So reminding the guy Shane of their earlier life is reminding them of the shame that brought them to their station. Uh, they're considered non-combatants, mistre- mistreating them in any way, even by prom- prompting them to remember their previous life in shameful and incurs a great amount of toe. Um, asking publicly if you have toe. Um, asking means that he Yeah, he does this quite a few times. Um <laughs> But that means, he doesn't get it. Yeah, because he just doesn't get it. He's just a stupid wetlander, even though he looks like an IO. <laughs> They're riding horses or whatever, and he's like, do I have toe? Is, is she mad at me because I have toe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first time remember I who's, I'm sure the first time she was like, I have toe, he probably looked down at like her bare feet and was like, yeah, you got you know several of them. I can see that. <laughs> You're not missing any. Like, what do you, what's like are you talking about, crazy lady? Crazy pretty lady? <laughs> Why do I feel like I like you? <laughs> um, but yeah, asking publicly means that you don't know or understand your shame, which is doubly shameful. Um, reminding someone of Toe they've already met uh, is shameful as well. After meeting Toe, there's no shame or obligation from whatever incurred it. So reminding someone of their previous shame, for instance, uh, by talking of their time as a guy Shane, or guy Shane rather, uh, incurs Toe towards them. So Rand goes through here where he has just a crazy amount of toe and he doesn't even fully understand the concept of it. He's just like, what do you mean I have toe? Like, but he does. Because right. he does it to, to Avienda quite a few times. And the sad thing is he doesn't, he doesn't understand 
even though she's explained it to him a number of times how it works, he doesn't understand. And I think part of it is that he doesn't understand how his actions affect other people. And we see that throughout the series is that he's a, he can be self-centered and like he wants things to go his way. He wants things to work out the way he needs them to work out. And I think that comes through with his toe situation sometimes to where he doesn't quite understand how much toe he has and or should have because it's it's a self-assessed thing yeah so if you don't think if you don't think you have any shame then you don't have any shame yeah every like i can't get the toe to like toh to toe connection so that's why i started laughing like i'm just sitting there Mm -hmm. thinking about Rand, just thinking about his toe like can i just cut one off and we're good like which one should it be? You only have 10 tries in your life if you were born with all 10 toes to make amends for your shame. After 10, you're just oh, that'd be bad. <laughs> and then I was thinking, do about, I give up the pinky for toe first? <laughs> then I was thinking about freaking Mushu from Mulan. Shame on your house, shame on your family, <laughs> shame on your cow. Right? <laughs> no, I got it. No, I will go forth and bring her back. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta make your ancestors proud. My little baby's all grown up. <laughs> I love that movie. Oh, it's so good. Second one was garbage. Yeah, I didn't even. Yeah. yeah. It's just. We can move on from Disney movies, though. So. Yeah. So, um, just Giotto, it's not a monolithic set of rules to be followed blindly. Sometimes what needs to be done would be against Giotto. Uh, committing such an act does not go against Giotto so long as the toe incurred is met afterward. So there's there's a repentance element to it that you can do things that go against the concepts and the ideas that Giotto holds, uh, and obviously the IL hold in such high esteem. But you just have to make amends for it afterwards. Yeah. Um, we see in the Shadow Rising, chapter 23, um, where Edwin starts her journey into training with the Wise Ones as a dreamwalker. She's kind of apprenticed to the Wise Ones. After the Stone of Tear, um, she's parted ways with Elaine and Nynaeve and chosen to follow Rand to the I.L. Waste so she could learn from the wise ones how to be a dreamer. And, you know, even though the Aes Sedai know much more about Sayadar than the wise ones, the wise ones are the masters of Dela'an Riyad. Um, So becoming an informal apprentice to them, she um, kind of attaches herself to this idea of Jiyato, even though she doesn't understand it. Um, she's kind of fallen under these really harsh training rules um, that she doesn't like, she doesn't understand, but she learns a lot and she starts to learn about Ji Ito, even though she didn't know about it at the beginning. And she under, she understands eventually that she has been um, like kind of building up toe towards them this whole time by lying and saying that she was a, an I said I when she really wasn't. She was just an accepted. And she's been kind of building up debt or obligation to the wise ones and her friends this whole time. Yeah. Um, and, and it's definitely interesting to see the point where she realizes this because she's She's got, um, what is it, Amiss and Bear and Sorilla. Uh, Sorilla? Sorilla? Sorilla, um, which is another one of our very active uh, character-inspired Twitter accounts that we've seen just chugging along out there. So, we, yeah, we notice. We see. 
Um, <clears throat> but they're all teaching her about the uh, the dream world. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name right now because I don't have the pronunciation up in front of me. Um, but, uh, you know, they're they're teaching her how to do things in the dream world and everything. And they banned her from going into it without them. Um, and she breaks that several times. And every time she breaks it, uh, it incurs a bunch of toe. Um, <clears throat> so then, uh, like, in, we go to Lord of Chaos. And this all kind of starts in Chapter 33. Um, so after she recovers from injuries that she got from a fight with uh with Lanfear. Uh, she was able to return to the world of dreams and was summoned by the hall of the tower in exile uh, she packs up uh you know like the next morning writes a note to to guan and leaves it to cow Indy to deliver to the long man uh, a miss bear <clears throat> and sorry so real good god Sorelia. Can we just can we pause and and have a chuckle about the dirty name of the inn that they were all meeting at to shack up? Uh, what was it again? The Long Man. Oh yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's the inn. <laughs> that that's just yeah, that's uh Kudos to whoever earned the name. I mean, someone had to be really impressed to name their inn after that guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Uh, it's it's just something I've noticed, started to notice, is that the the names of the inns are um, slightly subjective. Sometimes they, they they suggest things. Oh, good sir! I see your dragon has been reborn. <laughs> oh, time to break the <laughs> world, if you know what I mean. <laughs> at one point, they stay at some some place called the Nine Horse hitch and um i think min is like what's the nine horse hitch and somebody is like uh yeah that's not what that means that little member it's, is it's a nine nine horse itch i think is what it's supposed to be and they they slightly change the letters so that it's acceptable to put on a sign <laughs> But it's kind of understood by most of the characters that it's a dirty sign about um, crabs. Uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Almost like calling something like, you know, the sword's sheath or something like that, or the sword, the sword <laughs> yeah. scabbard. It's like you might as well just paint vagina on your sign. <laughs> you can't just call it in the flower. vagina, so we call it the sword it's scabbard. Power. <laughs> oh, man. oh man but uh um, i'm sorry for interrupting i just had to be oh you're good five years old for a second <laughs> you're good i'm fine with it i'm childish too it's no secret yeah yeah so uh anyway the three wise ones uh arrive at Egwene's tent and she tells them that she figured out traveling in the dream world and then obviously she admits to visiting the dream world on her own. Uh, and then she also, this is when she admits that she is only accepted and not in fact an Aes Sedai. Uh, she recalls Avienda uh, demonstrating how Elias paid for her. And she tells him that she has toe and asks them the favor of helping her meet that toe. And God do they. Um, in addition to a Miss Bear and Sorilla, other wise ones and apprentices join in in whipping a queen. Uh, and this makes what um, what the uh, Mistress of Novices has done to her in the past just pale in comparison. Like, Mistress of Novices has nothing on what the wise ones and their apprentices do on her. And it right. includes um, Aaron and Surinda, uh, Kosain and Estir. They join, but just for the tea. Uh, but when they finish, the wise ones tell her that she no longer has toe to them. So she's met her obligation. Um, and then they smile and hug her. Because uh, at this point, they're like, you know, past is past. She's paid for it. And they're not going to talk about it because it just is going to make them incur toe towards a queen. Uh, and after this, uh, a queen thinks that part of her heart will always be IL now. Um, 
Cerulea thinks that Tarek, the youngest great son of her great daughter, Amarin, would make a good husband for a queen. So to tell you how much they've repaired, she's like, hey, I got someone for you to marry. Yeah, it's like instantly back to on good terms. Yeah, it literally is instantaneous. As soon as it's done, they're all chummy. Um, uh, Bear says that she and Amiss will meet Egwene in the world of dreams to tell her the events in Karin. Uh, Bear offers to continue teaching Egwene, but Amiss will not. Amiss reminds her that she still has Toad or Ruart, who has gone north to scout uh, the Shido, which is another sept of Ael, the, the ones that refuse to follow the Dragon Reborn or the Karakorn. Um, Every, when I first read it, I thought it said carrot corn for some reason. Like that's just how it sounded, and I was like, "That does that can't be right." Well, and we know some of their um, fruits and vegetables are a little off from what we have too. Yeah, I mean they have to be for where they live. But um, so then Aguine uh, adds Melaine and Avienda to the list of people that she has toe to, uh, and the wise ones then all leave, and Aguine continues packing. So during that entire time, we see this wetlander, Aguin, <clears throat> who has already embraced a, a lot of other kind of cultural concepts um, and exposed to several more, uh, finally exposed to this one. And this is where we see an enormous turning point in Aguin because before this, she was still kind of bratty, kind of like all of kind of all about herself, like very confident and everything, uh, overly confident, I would say. But after this, uh, Aguin is far more humble, actually. Um, and she she pauses to think. She doesn't make a bunch of as many rash decisions like she used to. Um, and she's also a lot more forgiving after this as well, which I thought was an interesting dynamic that, you know, this concept of Giotto that even a wetlander could embrace it in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, and, well, have some, and that's yeah. Go ahead. That's the flip side of it, right? That's the, the other lesson that the wise ones taught her at the end in that really fantastic chapter um, is, you know, she is just hanging on. She, I think she's hanging on to somebody's ankles <laughs> just saying, you know, I have more toe to me and they're saying you can stop this whenever you want. Like, you know, the, the toe is self-assessed. You can stop it whenever you want. And she like grabs a strap for somebody and hands it to them and grabs their ankles and is like, you know, I have more toe. And they all kind of one at a time come up to her and forgive her by saying, you know, you, this, you have no toe to me for me. And that's the other side of the lesson. I think that they taught her is how to, how to forgive somebody and then, and then be done with it. Yeah. I mean, cause the thing is <clears throat> there's no shame in incurring toe in and of itself. Um, but you know, the shame comes from it, from failing to meet it. And in comparison, any other shame that you would incur other than, you know, not meeting your toe is definitely preferable in uh, IL society and the concept of GTO. Mm -hmm. um, but so lying obviously incurs a considerable amount. But just letting someone believe a lie did not not incur toe. So even if you knew it was a lie and you let them believe it, you didn't get any toe for it. Or obligation for it. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, and you we, could be told or reminded that you had toe, but you know that was shaming as well. But asking whether you had toe yourself, had toe, you know, like we talked about, meant that you didn't know. So it's it's a very dynamic concept. Yeah, and we we see it change throughout the series, um, kind of evolve into something different as the world changes and the the different steps of the al drift apart namely the shadow or shido um sept and they take in all of these kind of 
people who've rejected um, Rand and the truth that he um, put forth. There's kind of a, a mutation of Jito that happens where um, people who are guy shine are choosing to stay longer than a year. And with the guy shine, you're supposed to like release yourself after a year and a day. You're like, okay, I have met my toe. I'm going back to my family. And they weren't doing it. And that was upsetting towards the wise ones. But then we saw the Shido wise ones. <coughs> Sorry. The Shido wise ones were taking wetlanders as Guy Shine, doing all kinds of crazy shit that shouldn't have happened under Jito, but they were just doing it because they wanted to or because they felt like they could. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's like this whole evolution of the idea um, because the the society wasn't all together to kind of enforce its rules on itself, I think. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. And I'd, I'd say I'd have to agree with that. Like, it's definitely a widespread societal thing that not only do the people within your own sept or, or group and the wise ones there enforce it, but the septs enforce it on each other. Um, I mean, it's very tribal in nature, obviously. It's like a tribal kind of warfare and honor code that they as a people collectively agree to. And, you know, obviously the septs can be united. But left to their own, you know, there was that fighting between tribes or between septs. Um, and this continued fighting and, and everything, I think, was what did work in a, in a lot to enforce this concept across all of the IL rather than just, you know, five or six steps here following, you know, a full version and the others, you know, following um, a smaller version. But we know at this point that the, the shy do sept of AL, of IO, um, there was a lot more wrong with them than on, on face value and everything. I feel like they had to, uh, if it doesn't directly come out and say it, that they were being manipulated um, from forces from the, sh uh, the shadow. Um, just in the way they act and how vehemently they're against, you know, Rand as the Dragon Reborn or their Karakorn because their whole culture has been awaiting the return of this guy. And I mean, there's great fear because it says that he'll break the AL, the IL and everything, and, but he'll also lead them out of the of the threefold land. Right. Which he does. Yeah. And he and he does break them. Yeah. Um it's just it, nothing happens in the way that they expect. And that's the nature of prophecy, I think. And in in fantasy, and that's one of the things that Robert Jordan, Jordan doesn't change in this um, series where he's changed a lot of things is that prophecy happens. It always happens. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. But it doesn't always happen in the way that you expect it to happen. Yeah, I mean, I like the idea that you can't force prophecy because there's many times that Rand tries to force something to happen and it doesn't, and then something else happens. He's kind of distracted and he winds up meeting a prophecy. Like, look at the way he got uh, the second Heron Mart, right? Or Brand, I guess you would call it technically, but Rand got a Brand. And then afterwards, he's just sitting there wondering, oh, twice to mark him. Or twice branded to Marty, you know, he's like, oh, I guess the prophecy did get met after all. There's actually like two prophecies you know, like, in one. Because, yeah, it is. Because there was a prophecy that, you know, the dragon were born to fight the shadow in the sky. And he and everyone was like, yeah, we saw this image in the sky. And it's like, wait, what? And one, he did that twice, I think. I think so right now, because right. I'm I'm almost at the end of uh of the third book of the Dragon Reborn. Uh so this is the only one I remember current at the moment. Because that's the one where what you get the thought? image of him uh fighting Balzaman uh with the dragon banner behind him. Right. And that's when they're um at Flame. Yeah. I I always read it as flame, mm -hmm. even though that's not what it is. Um but 
I think he don't they also have like some kind of a sky battle at the end of the Eye of the World where they're fighting over Tarwin's Gap and um they don't fight over Tarwin's Gap or um that's where uh Rand doesn't know how but he shows up because all the um, all the all the um Shinarans Shinarans um, Shinarans yeah. yeah all the Shinarans are like you know the creator himself appeared the light itself appeared and fought for us then he just found himself on the battlefield and he decimated the the Trolloc and um, Merdral armies and then he was back at the eye of the world um, okay so I had never thought of it that he had um, kind of somehow traveled yeah to that place and was on the ground with the with the soldiers and yeah at least that's the way it's it's uh, that i interpreted as written that he essentially did travel you know decimated you know the opposing army and then essentially traveled back right um because it talks about how like he looks and behind him are all the the shanarans and then in front of him you know he sees you know hundreds of you know merge all and trollocs and then he doesn't know how but he just unleashes like holy fire on them basically and upturns the earth and does all kinds of crazy shit um but anyway uh back to to Giotto. um <clears throat> so you can still uh incur toe towards guy shane uh and but it's also considered the hardest obligation to meet in fact uh Suleen actually incurs this sort of toe and chooses to meet it by accepting uh, what would be a greater shame in the eyes of the IL and then she was given by you know incurring toe towards a guy shane uh, so she actually becomes a wetlander servant and which is a a big deal yeah that's a huge deal they look they look down on wetlander servants yeah so and everybody's all the wetlanders are confused because they see the guy shine as servants yeah i mean th there's some uh other interesting things that happen in il that, that, that work with giotto so like speaking to a man of his father father-in-law or to a woman of her mother-in-law you know second father and second mother in the il way was considered hostile enough to justify drawing weapons unless they had mentioned them first And if the offended, offended party instead touched you after you spoke, it was the same as touching an armed enemy without harming him, gained much G for them, and incurred uh, much toe. But it's the, the, the one touch has the ability. They can demand to be made Guy Shane uh, rather than just you know trying to meet that toe some other way. But doing so actually lessens the, the G the one who touched them receives and lessens the toe that they incurred. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in accordance with Giotto, if someone of a proper demand to be made, Gaishin had to be honored. The one that was considered improper could be denied. And the, the denial was shaming to the one denied. So if you improperly said, you know, demanded to be made Gaishin, and the person, you know, denied it, then you just incurred even more toe because you did it in an improper way. Um, yeah. It, it's it's crazy how the, just the dynamics of it, like, even now, I don't think that I fully understand the concept of Giotto. No, there's, there's a lot, a lot of subtle, nuanced um, things to kind of unpack in this concept and I, I don't know if we're even going to get to it all um or even if we could because i don't understand it all either um it's totally like trying to understand a foreign concept i mean it's almost like a free will sided personally induced form of like indentured servitude you yeah. know where where in indentured servitude, you have that monetary debt that you're doing physical labor to pay off. Whereas here, it's it's all about, you know, how much... You mean like when I go to work every day? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, but in here, 
it seems like a lot of the basis for it is more so how much you value your own honor, what what standard you set for your honor, you know, your G. Um, because if you incur a lot of toe, but you don't do a lot to, you know, to uh, redeem yourself from it, then the perception is that you don't value your honor, that you don't think your honor is that much important, which incurs toe in and of itself. Right. You know, so... The thing is, you know, everybody around you uh, or at least the IL around you are going to know that you have toe and they're going to know a rough idea of, you know, what amount of toe that is. Uh, and, you know, their kind of measurement from experience because it's impossible to live your life without incurring toe in one way or another. So I imagine, especially by the age that, you know, people can be made guy Shane, that you're going to have a fair understanding of, you know, how, roughly how much toe certain acts you know incur like oh if i bring up you know if i accidentally mentioned you know that she wore the white of the guy shane then you know i'm in a lot of trouble you know i've got to do you know i've got to get whipped for like five hours or, or whatever you know parallel there would be um so but it's just harder to measure because at least in indentured servitude there's you know a dollar amount or so you know there's a, a monetary right. value but in this it's the, the only value. There's a time limit like yeah. I've sold myself into slavery for a year or six months or something. Yeah. But in this, it's, you know, as we see with the example from McGuin, you know, it's it's done when you think it's done. Um, and we actually see her go to the point where people are like, you're, you're doing too much. Like, we're just going to forgive you. Right. So, And they all seem, the, the funny thing about that is, though, that they all seem proud of her for it. They're all like, you understand it more than any other wetlander ever has. You're basically one of us. Yeah. And there's even a point where she's getting whipped or, or, or beat or spanked, whatever you want to call it. Um, and she starts smiling and laughing. And they're like, and they're looking at her like, you know, are you all right, child? And she's like, I'm fine. I'm just so happy that you're willing to help me meet my toe. And that carries over even more whenever she comes back to the tower in exile, you know, after being made uh, the Amarillo seat of the tower in exile, you know, the little white tower, the little white, tower. the little white tower. But I mean, it's, it's crazy to see how the dynamic works. Um, and I, was, I think that's part of what makes the chapters that have the IL so uh, involved uh, so important. I mean, because there's even parts where Rand deliberately, even though he has the escort of maidens of the maidens of the spear, the far Duras May, um, when he deliberately works, so he goes somewhere without them, come back, they're all angry at him. Um, and if he doesn't realize that, at some point, I think he finally starts to realize it, and he's starting to kind of grasp Giotto. But even Avienda has to look at him and say, "You've incurred a great amount of toe." to the, to my you know to my old sisters you know it's at right. that point which she's no in, longer a far as me which in turn though incurs toe for herself yeah <laughs> because she had to tell somebody that he had toe yeah and they it's kind of funny because at the same point that avienda has made the the move from a maiden of the spear to an apprentice for the wise ones um, they basically assign her to him and say, it's your job to teach the Karakorn the ways of Chiato and the ways of the I.O. He's one of us. He should understand. And if he's going to lead us, he has to understand. And you're going to be the one right. to teach him. And it's a heavy burden on her because she knows that in order to teach him, she's going to have to incur toe after toe after toe. Yeah. And it's funny. He thinks she's a spy for the wise ones. He thinks she's there to to report back on everything that he does, and it's almost like he he discounts her knowledge and wisdom in the things that she can teach him because he sees her as I don't know an apprentice or a little girl or something. I'm not quite sure what's going on in his head, or even that I want to justify what he's thinking or feeling. I don't think I can. But he discounts what she has to teach him because he thinks she's there to spy on him. But he doesn't understand 
uh, Moraine has taught all the wise ones this like trick of eavesdropping from afar, or I think they call it remote listening. Yeah, it's something like that. I think is what it's, it's the trick that she uses called. forever. It's the same trick you see her use at the very end of the Eye of the World, where she's just, like sitting yeah. there smiling, staring at the blue stone, and she just heard everything she, Rand said. Yeah, anytime you see her with her little blue stone out, that's what she's doing. Yeah. Except for the time she's teaching um, Edwin how to um, how to like channel at the beginning. She's kind of using it as a teaching device because it's not really the stone. It's not a magic stone. It doesn't do anything magical. It's her that's casting this weave, but like a focus. she uses it kind of as a focus because um, they don't have any kind of a speaker or something they can use to like relay the sound through. So it has to be kind of an object. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because you see, uh, uh, where was it? They move whenever after Rand has led them across the Dragon Wall uh, into the wetlands, into what we consider the main world um, and the world right. of time. Is Kareen the first city that they come and take over? The first city. There's a bunch of villages before that, um, just because of the geography. Yeah, and they're they're chasing. Um, oh, what's his name? Bastard who thought he could um, be the Karakhan oh, the, the imposter. The, the guy that winds up leading the Shido. Yeah. I can't remember his name right off. I can't remember his name. I just listened to somebody doing a podcast where they talked about him. The White Tower, I think. Um, but, yeah, that's that's where they're headed is um, Karin. Yeah. So to yeah. get there... And you see several instances of Aguin and Avienda doing manual labor to start, you know, not only in training, because it's, it's not what I've learned about the IOs, even when you're being punished, whenever you're making up for your toe, uh, there's still a purpose behind it. It's still training in some sense, because Avienda and Aguin are doing these this physical labor and it's still training. They're not allowed to use yeah. the one power to help them at all. But it's it's still training them while they're meeting their toe, and it's, right. it's and either it's stuff like it's either bear or it's a things like go that tells them that right. It's things like go run around the the camp twenty times or something. Or I mean, because I th- dig it. I think the wise foot hole with your hand. Yeah, I think the wise ones have realized the correlation between a person's stamina and their ability to you know in some form of their ability to channel that the more stamina you have, the more and longer you can channel and use the one power as needed. So someone with a great deal of stamina should be able to, no matter what their level of affinity for, you know, for side should be because, you know, they're all female, uh, just like the Aes Sedai, um, that they can do more for longer because whenever they see the wise ones using the one power, uh, even, uh, the Aes Sedai around remark at just how skilled they are. They're like, it's crazy to think that someone that did not train at the White Tower has this much talent and skill in using the one power. Well, some of that is the Aes Sedai um, arrogance. Yeah. To think that somebody who did not train at the White Tower, who could possibly channel. You encounter it with the IL, you encounter it with the Wayfinders, uh, of the the sea folk, you encounter it with the um, even with the, the Damani yeah. of the the Sean Chan. You know they're like, oh please, there might they might have one channeler. They or the they you encounter it with the Black Tower. Oh, Mazrum Tame has been scouring the way the countryside. He might have found like two or three men who can channel. Yeah. Who, what men would want to join him that could channel, and they show up to take over the white, the black tower, and it's like hundreds of men who can channel, and they didn't even. It's like they can't even grasp the concept because their their arrogance was so set in this 
concept of the white tower is everything. There is no channeling that does not include the white tower. And even, even the Aes Sedai from the little white tower, as they call it, the um, Adjuin and uh, Elaine and Nainy's white tower, Adjuin is like, okay, I want all female. T- she does some things to make it so that it's that way again. She's, I want all female channelers attached to the white tower somehow even if they're not novices she opens up the novice book she develops relationships with the sea folk she works on freeing damani and you know all of these things she's she's doing it in order to um, make the world england again basically <laughs> she's trying to make she's trying to reestablish this idea that the white tower controls all female channeling. Yeah, she does. Cause she even lifts, um, like age restrictions on women becoming novices. Cause you know, after a certain age, oh, the white yeah. tower is like, oh, no, yeah. you're, you're too old to learn. We can't teach you. And you've lived to this point. You should be fine. And she also doesn't care about how little their channeling ability is. Right. right? She's, she basically, it's it's written in the book as extremely progressive, and I thought I think you brought an interesting perspective to it because you're like, oh well, you know, Green as the uh, as the Emerlin seat is doing this great thing in embracing all women who can channel, but I, I guess maybe I never thought about the concept that she's also replicating the White Tower in the you know if they're not connected to us, they they're not they may not be valid and everything. Where she says she's doing it to increase the power of the the little tower because she recognizes that even if they can't channel a lot they can still link and lend power to those that maybe have more ability or more training at which we see right you know we see novices and accepted being in links with the the full-fledged Aes Sedai both before and after and the I powers think, reunited I, th- I think the uh, the initial goal was to maybe increase their their power the amount of channelers they had so that they could retake the white tower and the long-term goal was to prepare for the last battle. Yeah, which comes full circle back to the humility that she has learned from Giotto and the value right. she's put on other people's. Because uh, I think there's a bit of toe that's incurred whenever you look down on... Because she's going to look at herself as a, as a female channeler, of course. And so she's going to have that automatic kind of kindred um, mindset to other women that can channel. So to just look down on them as lesser... I think she might view as uh, incurring at least some degree of toe. So to counter that, she's embracing these people uh, and, you know, acknowledging their their value as a way of not incurring toe, no matter how little or how much of the of the power you can channel. Yeah, even though I don't think I, I, she did, she doesn't she doesn't put it forth that way very often, as though Gia Toe has anything to do with her thought processes. But I think it does. And I think sh- they show that by, um, in other ways, she'll think about specific people and say, that person should spend some time with the wise ones. <laughs> that, this person oh, would yeah. benefit from training with the wise ones. For sure. I don't think she could be the Amerlin that we see, uh, af- you know, once she becomes an after, um, after the her episode with the the IL, um, and ultimately who she is all the way up to the end of the series. Uh, I don't think she could be that person, obviously, without, you know, understanding and embracing Gia right. I think um, we talked a lot about Gia the way it's supposed to be. It would be a disservice to the series without talking about um, the bastardization of G Ito that happens after Rand and the AL conquer um or liberate Carrion from um from the Shido. Oh, and yeah. there's this whole um kind of admiration culture that springs up around the AL and oddly enough around men to where 
there's this whole um, group of people that some of them were normal people, some of them were um, nobles, and they all kind of put aside their lives and adopt different clothing. The women start wearing uh, breeches and short coats, and the men um, start wearing, you know, similar clothes. And and they yeah. they um and they start growing their hair out like the ail and they start trying to adopt Gito without knowing what they're doing they're kind of fumbling around in the dark for it and nobody will explain it to them because that would incur toe towards yourself to talk about it right but they they're running around you know, telling each other, "Oh, I have toe, beat me," or what, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's just hilarious, and like Perrin thinks it's it's the dumbest thing he's ever seen, and Rand thinks it's silly, and <laughs> just because they don't they don't understand, they don't get it, but they're they're trying, which I think the trying is admirable, but they just fail so miserably sometimes. Yeah. The Ayala just kind of like, can you, can you like stop appropriating our culture, please? please? You know, no, my culture is not your prom dress, people. Yeah. This was a beautiful thing and you're just, you're ruining it. <laughs> stop. So they get. But they can't tell him to stop because then it's toe. They get minor points in their favor for admiring Jito and the AL culture. They get major points taken away from them for appropriating the culture. Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, there's a whole, there's a small section uh, where Avienda's talking to Rand and she's like, these wetlanders don't understand what they're doing. They're doing it wrong. They can't understand it. And she, you know, vis- is visibly frustrated by yeah. it, as most of the IL are. I mean, they avoid these people for the most part. It's funny, though. They've kind of attached themselves to fail and by extension, Perrin. Um, and they're kind of part of his and her story after after that. But because yeah, it's what what Bade and um, the the two female IL that and the one guy like the guy is Gaul. This is the one that uh, Perrin frees from the cage in that village yeah. in uh, the Dragon Reborn, I believe. Gaul and then the two the two ladies that he's kind of Chad Chad and Bio, I think. Right. And then one of them he wants to be with but she won't give up the spear for him yeah. unless he accepts her sister or near sister, however it is. And he's not okay with that. I'm not sure how that all ends up. I haven't read the entire series yet. Yeah. Which makes an interesting idea as to why Gaul is almost attached at the hip to Perrin because Perrin freeing him, I would imagine incurred a great amount of toe on Gaul's part towards Perrin. Right. You know, he's like, I owe you. And he they're rendering that, you know, and they, they incurred toe as well. Um well no, I don't I don't think they incurred toe whenever remember there was the one uh maiden of the spear that was about to die and uh, Nynaeve healed her like by the river. Right. And then later on she dies, she gets killed. Um, whenever when they're uh, Nynaeve, when they're free, them the, are in prison. The ladies yeah. from um, yeah being captured. Yeah, so I don't think there's really toe incurred for that one. No, it, uh, because they were because she was ready to accept death. She was willing to die, yeah. but again, um, and they just asked for help if it was able. It's, the toe is self-assessed, you know, and I think yeah he has put it on himself that, you know what, I'm going to stick with Perrin until I feel like I've relieved my life debt almost to use, yeah. to use a, an out of universe concept. Yeah. But we see that he grows very fond of, of Perrin. He res- comes to respect him as a warrior, even if he doesn't really like the tool he uses, he doesn't hate it. Right. But you know, like, like most of the IL, they're going to look at that, you know, Hey, this is an efficient, 
you know, spears are so much better. You know, use a spear and a buckler and, and you'll be a lot better. Um, and, you know, but he also is greatly respected because he's a blacksmith. Yeah. Because they put a huge amount of respect on blacksmiths just like they do wise men. They do. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it is it is interesting to see the interactions with like sideways glances between those three AL that have chosen to stay with Perrin and Fail. And the Sept, Fail Sept, I think they call themselves Cha Fail. Yeah. Those people. They wind up the they wind up becoming rather skilled and rather useful. Um and it I think it is their they're embracing or trying to embrace the concept of Giotto that when they are uh, remember when they're all prisoners? Um, yeah, they all get captured by the Shido. Yeah. That when they're all working together in that if I don't think if they were so open to the IL culture that that would have gone nearly as well as it wound up going. Right. <laughs> and it's funny, uh, Fail has this moment where she's being captured and she thinks to herself, you know, my three friends, or my two friends who are here with me, who are AL, they're going to help me escape. And then she realizes, oh, wait, their toe binds them and makes them useless as they can't even try and escape. They can't even think about trying to escape. Don't even think about trying to escape. Because yeah. I think she brings it up to them about trying to help her escape, and they're just like, I have more toe now. Yeah. So it's definitely interesting that, you know, how far-reaching and how just vital to their their day-to-day livelihood Gio is for the I.L., well, I, almost slightly envious. It, it, I mean, it is something to be um, admired and envied, but apparently not appropriated. Yeah, <laughs> don't appropriate the IL culture, or they may raise veils to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody wants that. Well, I think that's another interesting idea. I wonder where that comes from. The idea of. The needing, the needing to be veiled when committing violence. Hmm. Maybe that's something stemming from their history of following the uh, the way of the leaf. I don't know. I'd, ha- I'd have it's to really shaming. dig into that. That's like a that's like a really deep thought um, that requires a lot of <laughs> research. I think. Yeah, I would agree. If anybody knows. And wants to save me the time researching it. Send your thoughts to at Black Tower Podcast. I'm actually, that's not it. It's on Twitter. It's at Tower Podcast. <laughs> yeah. Twitter. But it, it's also Black Tower Podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, that's what it is. It's Black Tower Pod at Gmail, and Twitter is at Tower Podcast. Um, we're also on Facebook. Can also be found on Facebook. Yeah. Facebook is at Black Tower Pod as well. Um, we we recently started releasing our videos on YouTube. Um, our our hosting service can just do it for me automatically. So it's kind of an automatically generated um, video file that has no video attached to it. Um, if you want Static to image. engage in comments with each other, you can go find us on YouTube <coughs> and do that there to your heart's content. Um, Same name, the Black Tower Podcast. Yeah, search for the Black Tower Podcast, or you could search for the name of any of the episodes um, and find the the episode on youtube that way um we have the space can can we drop the link in the description for this episode for the youtube yeah yeah can we do that i'll I'll see i'll see what we can do um there's like a a character limit for the description yeah i was saying if we have the space i'll see i'll see what we can do um i wanted to take a second here at the end to talk about something we have coming up um at the end of december 
We're working on um, a really exciting episode. We're starting to flesh out the details um, for the week of Christmas. I think we're gonna we're gonna pre-record it um, so that we can release it that Friday in between Christmas and New Year's is our our hopeful release window. But we want to have a an episode with kind of no agenda other than that we're going to have two very important guests on our show um, where we've asked and they've agreed and the the two podcasters from the White Tower Pod, Jen and Jess, are going to be our guests and we're super honored that they would be um, the first people to be guests on our show. I think it's going to be um, a blast. They're always a fun time to interact with and talk to. Um, and I love listening to their show. So I, I can't wait to have them on. Um, we want to ask them questions. They want to ask us questions. We want to open it to um, questions from people who listen to our show and their show and any show. Um, so we're going to start collecting those questions now and um, kind of put them in a big a big document so that we can all be kind of thinking about them beforehand. Um, and some of them, some of the questions I might hold back and surprise them with. So um, if you have questions that you want asked um, of us or of the ladies from the White Tower podcast, send them to us. Make sure that you note somehow that um, you want us to ask this question of them or of us or, you know, put instructions in it of how you want it handled or we're just going to open it, openly ask the question to anybody. Yeah, it's it's going to be a great time, guys. Like, I'm, I'm so excited for it. I can barely contain myself. You sound excited. Yeah, well, I mean, I know I sound this way. I'm, I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to use all my excitement now. I need to let it build so that I'm super excited on the day. You know, just that, I know it's it's weeks you know. away. Um, we haven't even set a date to record it on yet. Um, and they were kind of teasing it in the, their last episode. <coughs> yeah, and wondering if they were allowed to even kind of say what was going to happen yet. And so I'm saying, you know what, go for it. Um. It's out there. Now. We want you guys to be excited too. You know, this isn't just a, an Andrew and Aaron or a Jen and Jess thing. You know, the entire community is already excited with the TV series coming out. Right. Um, obviously, there's a fair number of people that enjoy at least both both of our podcasts. You know, the White Tower and the Black Tower. Um, so we want you to be excited for this too. And this is a great opportunity uh, to get questions asked directly to four people from two different podcasts. Um, and I don't think we're putting any restrictions other than like what should be obvious common sense on it. Like, you know, keep them appropriate. Right. For sure. And you know what? You it's know. like we're going to we're going to kind of filter through those. And um, if if we feel like it's not an appropriate question. Then, you know, it's not going to be asked. So. Yes, feel yeah. free to ask. But otherwise, feel you know. free to put whatever questions you want in there, and we're going to reserve the right to not ask it. If that but yeah, so I look forward to to seeing your questions. And again, of course, you can send those on any format, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, email, anything. I know sometimes it can be hard with Twitter with the character limit. Right. Uh, especially when adding in, you know, something to indicate that you want it for the Christmas special in any particular way. Right. And well, you, but, can, uh, send, have plenty of ways. you can send us a direct message on Twitter also. Yeah, you can. In, in between Aaron and I, we check that all pretty regularly. I think Aaron winds up getting to it more than I do, but um, actually I know for a fact that you get to it a lot more than I do. Um, Cause I've been busy for the last week studying for an exam and even though you've been busy with the, the last at least a week trying to get over 
pneumonia, right? Yeah, I don't know how much of, um, I've been trying to mute myself. I don't know how much has actually come through into the recording, but I had pneumonia last weekend and I've, you know, I'm not contagious anymore and I've gotten most of the crap out of my system, but I've still got a little bit of this congestion in my chest. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, loosen up and cough it out. So I wasn't as active today on talking and kind of interacting with you. That's why I was trying to kind of keep myself um, from coughing so much. And yeah, it's not fun. I thought I was on on Thursday night, Friday night, I thought I was going to die. Like I, I seriously, I was like, the pain was so bad. And now you know how Rand felt after he channeled for the first time. Oh my gosh. What? And was just overcome with sickness. <laughs> so now you can say you have an intimate understanding and connection to the Dragon Reborn. Yep, I do. I'm going to get a whole bunch of dragon tattoos now. There you go. Two spirals on your forearms. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's actually <laughs> cool when people do that. I just don't think I could ever do it. Yeah. I don't know. I've thought about getting a Wheel of Time tattoo. We'll see. We'll see. Twitter will know if I do. I'll definitely tweet out a picture if I do. Yeah, that's definitely. There's a, no timetable on that's that. That's definitely something you tell everybody about. Yeah. Guys, look at my level of geek. <laughs> I am. Not that people are geeks for enjoying the am series. Am I appropriately nerdy? <laughs> Notice me, senpai. I have, I have a... A little tattoo on my wrist that says G Ito, and it only is half an inch long, and my oh, watch covers it up. <laughs> oh, God. Have you actually seen those? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. See? Appropriating culture. Stupid wetlanders. <laughs> Stupid wetlanders. They never get it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's, um, there's this whole thing about wetlander humor and ale humor, and I, I personally think the jokes in the books that the AL tell are more funny. I get, I understand them better than the jokes that like Rand tries to tell jokes. And it's like, dude, just, you are not funny. Leave it to the professionals. <laughs> just, just stop, dude. Look, man, let them be comedians. You focus on being the dragon reborn. And we'll be fine. <sighs> all right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. For us at the Black yep. Tower, I'm Aaron. And I'm Andrew. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>